Okay, I think we are pretty much ready to start. Uh, th thanks everyone from, for coming. It seems there's quite a few people trying to fill this room. It's, it's amazing. So how many of you is front-end developers? Uh, or teamers or quite a few, yeah. How many of you uh, are more of backend or PHP developers? Oh, great. Uh, so this presentation will be mostly about how can we leverage most of the team system and the render system to make teamers happy while they are teaming. There is useful bits for the, for the teamers and front-end developers also, so, uh, but, but there will be lots of PHP uh, in this presentation. So if you don't feel comfortable with that, uh, I'm not offended if you want to leave the room. So feel free to do so at any point. Um, let's figure out my clicker. Yes, so my name is uh, Lauri Eskola. Uh, my funny accent comes from Finland. Uh, I'm also a Drupal team system co-maintainer. There is uh, five, of five of us in total. Um, I work for a Finnish Drupal agency called Adroid. Uh, and I'm quite addicted into adding new kittens in the Drupal core. Uh, and that's, that's just the competition, how many mentions of a word that you like are you able to add in Drupal core. Uh, huh? Yeah, it's, it's comments or uh, mostly it's about test strings in the tests. You're testing if kitten is still a kitten after something happens. Yeah, so um, I also like to break Bartik. I've done that twice. I fixed it both times, but that's also what I, that's one of my hobbies. So this is gonna be the part when I'm gonna be talking about teams and it's gonna last maybe three minutes. And after that, we are gonna move to the module level. But I wanted to explain this because this is very important and this is also very confusing for many people. Um, so in, in Drupal 8, we have new teams. We have two of them added in there. The weird concept of teams in Drupal 8 is that we have stable, which is a team. It's a base team as a default team. So if you don't extend any team in Drupal 8, you will end up using stable, which is a team. Instead in Drupal 7, if you don't extend a team, you don't extend a team by default. You can override that by setting base team false when you don't have any base team. But stable is being used by default. We have another base team, which is called classy which is the stable, but with classes. And then we have three of the teams that we consider as a Drupal product, which is Bartik, Seven, and Stark. So Bartik is the default team that you see when you install Drupal. Seven is the default administration page team. Um, these three teams are marked internal. They are part of the Drupal product, and you shouldn't be extending them. So if you want to create a uh, team extending Bartik. You should instead copy whatever is inside Bartik and create a new team out of that. Because uh, in Drupal 8, uh, now that they are marked as part of the Drupal product, it means that we can improve them. And let's say if you want to change something in 7, now it is possible during the uh, Drupal 8 lifecycle. If you want to create new button styles or if you want to create new, uh, new stylings for the fill upload element, uh, we can do it in seven. And the reason why you shouldn't do, uh, the ex uh, why you shouldn't extend these teams is because if we change something in these teams, it might break whatever you have changed in your team extending them. But you're allowed to copy them and create your own, uh, own customizations based on that. Uh, so this is how the teams in Drupal core looks like. It's getting quite complex. We have now four levels of markup. So the, the light blue ones are the ones that you shouldn't be extending or using as a base for your markup. The, the dark blue ones are the ones that you should be using to, to create your markup. So classy is the one with the, with the classes and stable is the ones without classes. Classy extends stable. So if you, if you create a team like Seven and Bartikar, they are kind of like the teams that you will create in the client project. They, extend, they, they are in the chain of extending classy and bo uh, both stable. Uh, so just to make it very clear, how should you be choosing the team? 
So if you want to have classes, by default, your, 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 your option will be always classy. If you don't want to have classes, then you have two options. You can either extend stable or core. Uh, stable has back backwards compatibility that core doesn't have. So if you don't understand what is the difference, then you probably want to go with the stable. Uh, so we want to be able to uh, make new, new changes for the markup and uh, re-implement the markup in between the releases. And then whenever the ne next release will happen, uh, Drupal 9, we will just remove whatever is inside stable and whatever is inside classy, and that will be the new markup. And then we start again with the stable and classy uh, uh, from the 9.0. So that's pretty much what I had to talk about the teams today. Let's proceed for the, for the team system itself, which is the main topic of today. So uh, this is the pipeline kind of like ideology we have in the team system. So every time you uh, uh, print something, it goes through these, these, specif these specified steps. I'm going to be using lots of code examples uh, when I talk about the team system. Um, all the code examples are available um, on, on my slides that I'm going to be uh, sharing on Twitter, but also in GitHub, there is a wall functional module that has the, these bits of code inside the module that you can download and install on your site if you want to have some sandwiches. I hope you are not getting too hungry because it's the before lunch uh, session. I'm going to be talking a lot about the sandwiches. <laughs> um, so the first step of the team system is the hook team implementation. Uh, that is the place where we kind of like set the rule set. Um, we set the uh, default implementation of, the, of this thing that is going through the wall pipeline. Uh, we can set some additional metadata that affects the way that specific piece is being managed during, the, during this trip. But um, the, the most what you want to use it for is just to set what kind of data is going to go inside this pipeline. So. Uh, I'm creating in, my, in the hook team implementation a new, ho new hook, hook team implementation, which is called uh, sandwich, so that you can call inside the controllers hash team sandwich. Then we specify a new item, which is called variables, and that sets the default variables that will always exist in that pipeline. The reason why we create this is because we want to be able to trust in the PHP and in the template that every time I do something, at least these things will exist. So even though the, the, the controller that creates the render array doesn't add a specific piece of, uh, of this uh, thing here, it will pick the default value. So if you are, if you are preprocessing, preprocessing this data or processing it somewhere, you can always trust that the name, bread, cheese, veggies, protein, and condiments will exist, and they are the correct type of data. Uh, so in, in here, you can see the hash name. It is the same as that. That, that is a, big, um, a very common question. Why do we have the hash? Bef why, why do we prefix all these variables in the, in the render arrays? Because it probably doesn't make any sense, and it doesn't make any sense. It's just a rule that we have because um, in the render system, we try to render a children render arrays, and if it doesn't have the hash, we consider it as, as a, another render array that is inside this, and we try to render it, uh, render it as a children render array. So let's say if you have a page, and you have the regions inside the page, and the, the regions that you have in the page render array, they don't have the, the hash before the they are not prefixed with the hash. If you render the wall page render array, it will render them as the children items of that render, uh, render array. So they will be rendered separately with their own rules. And, and instead, when you have the, so when you have this hash prefix, this will be passed into this render, uh, uh, this, this uh, hook team item, and you can use it in that pipeline. Um, the next step, after you have created your render array, that happens is the team suggestions. And team suggestions are useful because they uh, allow you to create logic 
what kind of processing should happen uh, for depending on different kind of rule sets that you can define in this hook. So you, the, the most common or m and most well-known use case of this is probably nodes. You can override the default node template for article with the node dash this article. That is called theme suggestion. And um, someone might think that that's some magic. It is magic, but it's magic that you can use yourself for your own uh, hook, theme uh, hook theme implementations that you create. So in my sandwich module, I have created the sandwich hook theme implementation. And I want to create a theme suggestions for that based on the name of the sandwich. So that each of the sandwiches could be uh, uh, separated and they could have their own preprocessing logic and their own template that you can override for specifically this sandwich. And that happens simply by adding a one line in this hook. You simply just return an array or a string if it's a single item of the um, theme suggestions that you want to create. And it will just take the variable from the variables, then the name variable, and create a new theme suggestions from that. And then it will override the default option if, if someone has specified a template, which is called that. You are also able to um, modify the already created theme suggestions or create new ones after all these has been gathered together in the alter function, alter hook. Uh, there you have all the theme suggestions available from here. And you can create your new ones or you can, you can remove already existing ones if you don't want to have some of them. Maybe in some specific case or whatever. Um, This might be very confusing because that is a that is something that works by magic. Definitely, that's you somewhere create you, you specify it to be loading something, and uh, it's very far away from the end bit of this, and it's very difficult to configure uh, because it can happen in multiple places. So there is a tool that you can use to simply just show all the all the possible theme suggestions. This is actually also available in Drupal 7. It got backported from Drupal 8. So you can use this in Drupal 7 if you are still working on Drupal 7 sites. And it simply happens by adding a um, team debug variable inside your settings PHP to true. There is an example of that in the uh, new versions of Drupal 7. So you can take a look on the new default settings PHP and see how, how it's done in Drupal 7. In Drupal 8, this happens in the services.jaml. So this is a specific services.jaml on your site installation. And there you just tell the tweak that, uh, OK, debugging should be on. And what happens when you turn it off, on is in, when, you are, uh, when you are using Drupal, in the markup, when you look at that, you get this kind of bits of, of text inside there, which explains to you that, OK, now we are outputting a node. Uh, for node, you can use all these four different templates. You can override it with teaser, which is specific for the view mode. But even more specifically, you can uh, override it with the article specific template. Or even more specifically, you could override it with the specific view mode and specific node type. You can see all that in this uh, theme, uh, theme debug output. You can also see here uh, which template is being used right now, the specific location of that template, uh, which is very helpful because, uh, as I showed a little bit earlier, that there is quite a few places where we are now uh, placing all these templates. Uh, it will explain you, it will, it will explicitly specify which template and which directory is it located. So you know if you want to create this uh, article uh, template that you probably should be copying this template as your base without having too many modifications for you, uh, for that. Uh, let's say if, if you would have a, a, a um, template coming from Classy and you, and you would copy the one from Stable, it wouldn't have any classes. And if you've already built something on top of that, it would break your things. So it's very important to take a look which uh, template are we using at that point. Um, after the theme suggestions, we get to the preprocess functions. 
uh, in the preprocess functions, you can modify the variables before they are given for the template. Uh, I suggest not to use the preprocess functions, especially when you are creating your own preprocess function, uh, your own hook team implementation. Uh, so if you created the hook team yourself, I suggest not to use the preprocess functions. Um, preprocess functions are something that we probably are, are going to redefine uh, before Drupal 9 very heavily. So these are not going to exist as they are right now, hopefully. Uh, because we didn't have the time to, to figure out what we want to do with the preprocess functions during the Drupal 7 and uh, between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. But what you can do in the preprocess function is to just simply override the, the variables that are inside the, your hook team pipeline. Uh, so here you don't anymore have to uh, care about the uh, the uh, prefix, the hash prefix. They don't exist anymore here because it's not relevant at this point anymore. Um, this would, um, so the first thing that happens is the template preprocess function. The reason why it's not called hook preprocess function, which is here, is that because there can be only one instance of this function. And that is the initial preprocessing of, uh, of that template, which means that you can provide one preprocess function that 99.9% that, that .9 of times exists in the module providing the hook team implementation. Uh, and then the other modules could trust that that preprocessing has happened before we get there. So this will run always before the hook preprocess pre functions. If you would create the hook preprocess functions in the, in the module specifying the hook team implementation, it would mean that the other modules couldn't rely that that, uh, that uh, hook has been run before them because it's only based on the module weight instead of anything else. Um, so in this, this example, I'm first overriding the name in the kitten, then I change it into llama on the preprocess function, and then, then I have even a third implementation, which is the specific one with, for a Chicago. So if this would be a Chicago sandwich that is being printed, uh, the name in the template that you are outputting would be Flamingo. And uh, so that is the order they are being run. Uh, after the preprocess functions, uh, so he, just to clarify, you can see here, there's like, there's two levels. But the, this level is only the one function that you can specify. There cannot be multiple instances of that. These ones, you can have multiple ones in different modules and different themes. After that, we get to the template and here we have all the variables that has been specified in the uh, hook team, uh, in the team system pipeline. I will explain a little bit more of the tweak a little bit later. I'm going to explain quickly the render system that is built on top of the team system that you can use to... So the render system has been modernized a little bit for Drupal 8. So it's a little bit more modern than the team system is. It's a little bit less... Uh, based on the expectation, uh, expecting th th some things happening, and also it's for, it, it uses some modern systems like plugin system, and so it, it's way more modern than the theme system is. Uh, and how it works? This is a very very confusing picture, but it was the easiest way to put it on one slide. So what happens is that when you when you create a render element, so uh, probably many of you has used a let's say a form API when you say hash type and input or text, text field. That is a render element and it will create something inside here. It will, it will provide a default values for the theme system and that will print it and then it will give it back for the render system. So what happens is that we here we predefine the render array in the render system. So this is used to create a render array we put it into the theme system in here, which outputs it back to the render system, where you can still modify whatever the theme system has done to it. So they are very tied together. Here is a render element. So I'm creating a render element called sandwich, which will provide some default values for my render array. So we want to always attach this library for the sandwich. 
we also al always want to have the same bread, we always want to have the same condiments. So you don't have to specify them every time here. That is one of the, the good points of using render element. You can specify this kind of uh, default values. But what, what are the, the, the even better uh, improvements or better things in the render system is that you can def uh, define which uh, function should be called to, to uh, alter or modify this uh, render array. And there you can do your modifications in the set order that you want to have. Uh, if you want to create your uh, uh, own pre-render function inside a uh, theme or a module, you can just use the element info alter and add your own pre-render function, a pre-render callback here, and then you can do your altering in there. Um, that is, uh, that is really powerful. You can use it for really, really complex things, like Form API is built on this, so obviously it takes some time to get used to using it. Uh, but it makes sense to uh, make the effort to try to use it because it's very powerful and it allows you, do, uh, allows you to do lots of things, a, a lot more things that the, than the theme system allows you to do. So all these code examples that I showed, you can find from this GitHub repo and you can install it on your Drupal 8 site if you want to and play around with the cool sandwich menu we have in there. You can even do pull request if you don't like the design of the page it provides. So let's proceed for the tweak. Tweak is probably something that excites many of you, hopefully. Uh, I'm gonna be talking a very basics, more of like, I'm creating a module. What do I have to know to create the, the default template in my module. So, uh, the very basics in uh, three sentences is that if you want to say something, use double square brackets like this. If you want to do something, use the square bracket and present. If you want to comment something, it's the uh, square bracket and hash. Uh, so this is the basics of TIG in probably one slide. But I'm going to go, go little bit deeper than this. So let's start with printing. So whenever you print something inside Twig, uh, there's a little bit of logic attached into printing something. So let's say if you're accessing data inside sandwich called cheese. Uh, so accessing data in Twig happens um, almost every time with this one syntax. It's just dot and whatever you are accessing inside that, that variable. Uh, so let's say when I'm printing this cheese inside sandwich, it could be an array item in an array. It could be a property inside an object. It could be a method or even a method with the get or is method conventions, uh, which makes it uh, very powerful because you only need to care about this syntax, and whatever you are printing, you always use the same syntax. Some people might think that this sounds slow. This is one of the tips that I have for you. There is a tweak PHP package uh, you can, that you can install on Linux. Instead of compiling the tweak files into PHP, it will compi uh, compile some bits of it, which is especially this, uh, this bit, into C. Uh, which will make it a lot faster. So if you, if you are having problems with the slowness of it, you can install this and it will make it a lot faster. And it, it doesn't require any configuration, it's just simply that you install it and it will work automatically. So for that reason, it's very useful. Uh, debugging variables in Tweak, right now the best way to do it is install devil and kint modules Kint comes inside devil module, so you only need to download one package. And um, after, after doing that, you can use a kint function inside the, uh, the template. It will output all the properties of an object, if it's an object. If it's an array, you will get this kind of a list of all the items inside the array. You will have a tab for the available methods, if it's an object which has methods. Excuse me. And uh, it's, uh, it's very powerful. Uh, 
The problem with this is that there's lots of protected properties. So if you're a teamer, it might be a little bit confusing. There is data, but I can access it anyway. You, you just have to, have to find the right methods, and it's, it's difficult. So I hope that we can find a solution which will create simply just a list of things that you will get and whatever is inside it. Uh, so that we, would, we could hide all the protected values. Also, this doesn't take uh, in account all of the get or is method convention things. So let's say a node has a get title method. Uh, that, so you could just say node.title, but Kent only shows you in the available methods get title. Um, so you have to know a little bit of how it works before you can use it. Uh, so it, it, it would make sense to have a more powerful tool for that. So in, in Twig, instead of having only simple functions, we have also filters, which are meant to manipulate a, a variable or, or a piece of string or a piece of an array. Uh, so what filters do, they simply take some data inside them and return it in a different format. So let's say a length filter takes this text as a parameter for a function and returns it in different format. There could be a filter called uh, uppercase, which would transform text into uppercase text. Or there could be a filter that uh, translates a string. There is a T filter which translates the, the variable, which means that you can, you can translate your strings inside the trick template. And what it does, it simply takes uh, the whatever string is there as a parameter for the function, and then it returns it in different format, just like it works in PHP. So filters has to be defined in a Twig extension. So not all the PHP functions are available in a, as a Twig filter. You have to create one, your, one yourself. There is plenty of examples online how to do it. It's, it's quite simple. Uh, there's also functions which are quite a lot like uh, PHP functions, but they also have to be defined to be able, uh, available inside a template. One of them is attached library that you can use just to simply attach libraries to a, to a template. Um, probably some of you have struggled with the show and hide functions that are not fun at all because of uh, when you call the hide function in a render array, it will change the state of that array, it will mark this as printed. And if you uh, want to render it multiple times in different places, it is still hidden and you might be a little bit confused why, why is it so? Because of, uh, it ha you, you might think that it's not printed, but it's just marked as printed because of the height function has done so. So in Drupal 8, we instead have a simple filter that is called, called without. And what it does, it simply takes an array and remove, removes these array keys from that, uh, from that array and returns everything else except that. So it doesn't change the state of the array. So if you print the content for multiple times, it, it will print everything except the ones that you have specified do not print during that time. Uh, Twig has also some pretty cool logic to not avoid duplication. So now, now that I showed you that you can create a overriding template, but you don't always have to override the whole template. You can just override a small piece of the template. So you can create this kind of a tweak block inside a template. These are not, they, they don't have anything to do with Drupal blocks, but they have the same name, which is confusing. But they are a tweak blocks which can include, let's say this has a h2 and a link. And uh, if you want to override it for the front page, on the front page we want it to be h1, we can just simply say that extend this template and override block title. So here I have the dots kind of like visualizing that there could be lots of other uh, markup. Uh, in the, in the template, but you don't have to include it in the overriding template. And whenever you change the other stuff in the template, it will change on both of the places. There's also macros that are kind of like functions, but they, uh, 
work a bit differently because you have to import them. But what I use macros for is, let's say, if I need to create logic based on how a uh, wrapper is being, uh, what, what kind of wrapper does uh, something have, you can use the macros, which is a function. Uh, and the reason why I do it like this, instead of creating a if items count, then add a div and else add a span, is because then I need to have this, this logic in two places, in the beginning and in the end. And that breaks the code highlighting of, uh, let's say, if you use Sublime or PHP Storm, the code highlighting doesn't work anymore with that because it doesn't know what's happening. Uh, also, you might really easily break uh, these if else's. If you changed the one in top, you would always have to remember to change the one in bottom, which, which uh, could very easily lead in the broken markup. Um, this is probably the most difficult part now to understand. Uh, this is very complicated stuff that I'm going to talk about now, but it's still very useful, and I hope that uh, you get something out of this. Um, I could do a whole 45 minute presentation of this. And for that reason, it's really difficult to explain it in five minutes. But it's about auto escape. And uh, probably some of you heard uh, when Dree said in his keynote last fall that we have some problems with Twig, why we are not probably not that ready to release right now during the DrupalCon. And uh, the reason why we were not ready to, to release wasn't because of Twig was broken or there was anything wrong with Twig, it was that our configuration of auto escape was broken inside Drupal core. And so this is the stuff that was blocking us from releasing Drupal 8 last fall. Uh, so first let's start what is escaping. That is the most simplest case. Escaping is that we want to turn this string into something that the, that the browser won't render, which means that uh, all the, all the possible characters that might lead into, in the browser doing something with them. Like, like this EM. Um, even though it's just a text here, the browser considers it as HTML and renders it differently. Obviously, EM is not, not, not dangerous at all. But if this, this would be a script or something else, it might be dangerous. So what it does, it creates them into UTF characters so that the browser won't care about them, and then you can see on the UI whatever was inside here, which makes sense because let's say if someone outputs their name as something like this, you wanna, want them to see that on the browser, you don't want it to render as HTML. Uh, so what is auto escaping is the same, but we do it automatically for every string that is being printed so that every time you put a variable, you print a variable inside Twig. We do that kind of escaping for it. So in Drupal 7, whenever you print a string, you have to remember to escape it manually. In Drupal 8, we do it automatically for every string, except the ones that we think we can trust. I'm going to explain that uh, in brief. But uh, the reason why this is so important, the reason why there's people excited of this, is that 33% of times when you install a security update on your client site, it's because of XSS bug. It is, it is the way biggest uh, uh, one instance of security bugs we have in Drupal core. But that's not all. 51 and half percent of times you install a security update for a contributed module so more than half of the times you install a security update on a module is because of XSS. So obviously we wanted to make, we wanted to do something to make that risk lower. Um, so I'm not going to explain how to auto escape your stuff because it wouldn't make any sense because it happens automatically. Instead, what I'm going to explain how to get rid of auto escaping, how to <coughs> when you want to print this EM, how can you do it? So the easiest way is to create a render array. Uh, you can use the hash markup to, uh, to print, uh, print markup 
and it will do XSS filtering for that. So let's say if you want to output a script, it won't still print. But EM has been whitelisted. We think that is safe, and we allow you to print that. Uh, then, after I said, okay, we have this XSS filtering functionality, why don't we just XSS filter everything? Like, that would fix all our problems, then we don't have to care about this, all, all this stuff. The reason why we can't do it is because it's really, really expensive. Uh, we have to read all the markup through and figure out if there is something that is dangerous. For this kind of a string, which is only a few characters, it, it doesn't make any difference whether we run it or not, because it's so short. But if we run it for, let's say, thousands of characters, it would make a huge impact already. So we can do it for everything. Um, so, if you use the, the hash markup or whatever other render array, you can create a template or, yeah, there's different kind of render arrays that you can create. It will print in the browser as something, uh, as HTML. There is other ways than that. Uh, so, there is a new formatable markup object in Drupal 8. Uh, probably many of you remember format string function from uh, Drupal 7. This is pretty much the same, but it's now a object. So you give it as the first parameter the, the string that you are formatting, and then the parameters. So how this works is um, whatever is inside here, if it's not in, the, in, the, in these placeholders, we can trust that it's, input, it's being put there by the developer, so we can trust, we can trust it that that is not XSS. And then we filter, we, we escape all of these bits, uh, which makes this in total safe because all the, all the user input, input, input data has been uh, escaped. But then whatever the developer has put is not being, being escaped. So with this method, you could pretty much put any kind of markup. It doesn't have to be whitelisted or anything. We don't do any kind of filtering for that because it's always put by the developer. Um, there is also its caveats. So basically every implementation that we have is now, if you want to put markup, we have to make it an object. So we have this uh, formidable markup, we have a markup object, we have the translatable markup object, and all of them are markup objects, and uh, that creates its own caveats. So, uh, there's also other caveats than that, but um, the biggest problem uh, conceptually is that auto escape strings are actually not always safe. They are safe whenever they are escaped and, and whenever it's being printed inside HTML node. Uh, and now this gets even more complicated. So if you print your escaped string inside an HTML element, it is not anymore in the HTML node, which means that there is a completely different set of rules that applies for that string, and it is not safe anymore, even though it's ex escaped. Uh, one, another good example is the uh, ahref. If you add a URL in there, the URL could be anything. It could be JavaScript or anything. And, uh, here is one example, the JavaScript alert. We are creating a um, JavaScript alert that has XSS, and none of the characters that are in there would be escaped, even though we escaped that string. There is a solution for the URLs. Uh, for the first one, it's just please don't put uh, print variables inside HTML elements. Uh, there is few exceptions. One of them is attributes object that you probably want to print inside the templates if you've used Drupal 8 already. There's lots of attributes objects that are coming from the uh, uh, theme system. Those you can print because we can trust that they are always attributes object and uh, it has its own escaping methods to make these things safe. Uh, but if you are using the formatable markup, uh, please don't do this. For the second one, there is a, another solution, which is a colon placeholder, which will escape the string, especially for the href 
uh, use case. So this one here wouldn't cause any harm when you use the colon placeholder. Uh, then there is the other caveat, which is b because of the simple fact that we have lots of objects now laying in the, uh, the uh, PHP. So let's say if you use the theme function, uh, it used to return a simple string, but now it returns an object. So these two here are equal. So the function simply returns a translatable markup object. And if you create an array and you put that as an array key, you will get a fatal error, even though this translatable markup object has a two string PHP magic function. Um, so you have to cast it in the string which will convert it in the string and then it will work. But it's very confusing. Um, there is not that many use cases, gladly, where you have to do this. But let's say if you create a hierarchical uh, select list, many people use this kind of uh, thing. And it breaks really badly because of the fatal error. Uh, there's also other caveats that the auto-escaping is only as, uh, enabled for quick templates. Uh, so if you, if you use any custom templating engine uh, or if you're using theme functions that are, that are now removed, are deprecated, and all, all, all the implementations are removed from Drupal core, uh, they are not auto-escaped. Uh, so this works with Twig. We use Twig auto-escaping and it makes sense. Uh, and that was also why the PHP templating engine was uh, overtaken by the new Nyancat templating engine. Uh, <laughs> There is a long story of that probably available in the issue. It basically happened in DrupalCon Barcelona. One night we were drinking, bar, uh, drinking beer in the hotel lobby and we just started talking that PHP template is not very secure, let's remove it. And we had to figure out a new templating engine because we have to test it automatically whether it's still possible to create a templating engine. So we created Nyancat templating engine. Uh, you can use it if you want to, it actually works. The problem is that you can't use any diffs because it converts them into Nyancat ACM elements. <laughs> so uh, you can try to figure out something, but it's not. But, but the fun thing was that we figured out after we did it in five minutes that it was more secure and uh, way more faster than PHP template was. So what we said, we replaced a joke with another joke, but the other joke was even worse joke. Just it was less of a joke. Okay, uh, any questions? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, so you've got all of these filters to use in Twig, but what if you want to debug them? Where do you find them in the PHP side of Twig? Uh, yeah, that is actually a very good question because there is not really a way to list the, uh, the uh, filters right now or the functions. So the best way to do so, that what I do is uh, there is the uh, backslash twig extension class, the base class that is in, inside twig. Uh, go there and with PHP Storm, you can find usages of that class. So you can find all the, uh, all the different uh, twig extension classes. And then you can see in there the lists of the filters and functions they are defining. Um, it's a little bit of uh, pain, I know, and it would be nice to have some debugging tool for that. So they're sort of hard coded and spread out. Yeah, I can actually probably show you really quickly. Um, so I, I'm now in the Drupal big extension. So how you could find it? So here is the backslash twig extension. You will go here and find all the uh, usages of this. It would happen just simply by here. And it will find wherever it's being used. And here I find the Drupal's example. And uh, here I have get functions, which will list all the functions that this defines. So there's render bar URL, the address library one I mentioned, or get filters, there is the T filter and there's lots of other filters. So this is the, the best way that I've come up uh, of debugging those. That was also how you define your own uh, filters and functions if you do so. Yeah? Um, on that slide you had about 
about cheese, you know. Uh, so you have a property of cheese in sweet, and it could mean a whole lot of things. Um, what happens if two of those uh, things exist? So, so I'm going to go back there. So, so this slide. So uh, this is simply the order that we are accessing them. So let's say if there is a property that is called uh, cheese, and there is a method that is called cheese, it will pick the first one. So the cheese property would be the first one uh, on the list. Uh, the good thing about this is if the cheese property is protected, it doesn't affect this at all. So it's only if it's public and accessible. Is there a place where you can find this list and all the work um, I think this is available in the Twig documentation. It is not probably as sim simple as this one is, but uh, there is definitely a list in the Twig documentation available for this one. So many of the Twig related documentations are available in the uh, Sensio Labs Twig documentation. It's a ver really, really extensive documentation they have there. So it's very useful, like the, the way you create a new Twig extension. If you want to create filters or functions, you can find all that from the Sensio Labs uh, documentation which is also good for us because Drupal community is always not that excited of writing documentation so that we can get some help from others. Any other questions? I think we have still time for one before lunch. If you have, yeah? Yeah, we have a lot of problems or issues, let me say, uh, with uh, Twig uh, template files, uh, logic in Twig template files, like if, stems and stuff like that and uh, variables and the caching. Oh, yeah. Anything about that? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Uh, so there is lots of problems with the caching. And if you have any if inside a Twig template, you basically have to include a cache context for that. And that is the, one of the good u uh, use cases that I found so far for the preprocess is to, in preprocess function, add the uh, cache context that you need for that template. It's, it's a big pain. And what, what I've been talking with uh, a few other people is that we could add a new uh, function uh, which, where you could define the cache context uh, for the template. We, we also discussed whether we could do it automatically. Because uh, so trick templates are being compiled into PHP. So we know what's inside it, and we could do a logic in there based, based on the ifs. But it's really difficult to figure out what's inside them and like what kind of context we should be then creating. So right now, the best option is to do it in preprocess function, uh, just add the cache context. And maybe in the future, we could add a function for that. But you cannot just add the cache, cache context. You have to actually use a, a render array again. You have to use an inline template. So, so there is, um, so one of the workarounds that I found is to uh, create empty render array that doesn't print anything. It can be markup or whatever, as long as it's empty, and create cache contexts inside there and just print it inside the template. 